Welcome to the Backyard Professor Responds videos. I have found another LDS apologetics video with which I must respond because it is so woefully out of dated and because the background of the LDS apologetic with which this video from Jeff Roundy of Latter-day Saint Q&A uses is woefully inadequate based on new light and knowledge. Let's get this show on the road, shall we? So tonight is not a live session, forgive me. I'm going to be live on Thursday night, January 5th, with the world-class Bible scholar and classicist Dennis R. McDonald. I'm having him return. We are going to be talking about his incredibly awesome book, Synopsis of Epic Tragedy and the Gospels, How the Greek Epic Literatures Has Influenced the Gospels, one of the singular most important texts written on the New Testament in decades. Now, I know that's quite a claim. I will be utilizing McDonald's materials extensively in my New Testament commentary video series. So Thursday Night Live, you don't want to miss this. You have a chance to ask questions of a world-class biblical scholar and classicist. We will have a Q&A, and he extensively knows this material, so come and join the fun. Also, Sunday, I have the return of Dan Vogel. Mormon historian extraordinaire. So I am very excited. I'm wearing these headphones so that I can avoid the echo. Some of my videos echo. So I'm going to play a clip and then I will be responding to this clip uh, with this full understanding. LDS apologetics on the book of Enoch have been refuted. They simply have set up the historical information completely wrong. Let's take a look at this and see what is going on. I love what, what uh, Bradshaw said uh, here in this, this just released um, piece here about an updated thing about uh, this, always asking this question. Um, critics pointing it out, since Joseph Smith is well aware that the biblical book of Jude explicitly quotes one Enoch, the most obvious thing he could have done to bolster his case for the authenticity of the book of Moses, if he were a conscious deceiver, would have been to include the relevant verses from Jude within his revelations on Enoch. But this is this the prophet did not do. The question also requires that we assess the likelihood that Joseph Smith knew about the 1821 publication of one Enoch. Um, Salvatore, uh, the, uh, that was uh, translated by Richard Lawrence. Salvatore Krill's master thesis at Durham University cites Michael Quinn. The evidence of the prophet's access uh, to this translation of one Enoch has moved beyond probability to fact. He sees no other explanation for the substantial similarities he finds between the Book of Moses and the superpiritual Enoch literature. However, Krill is at odds with other scholars. For example, as a result of his study, I uh, think historian Richard Bushman concluded it is scarcely conceivable to those men even knew. Lawrence's Enoch translation. By the way, when they came out, they nobody cared. Uh, they didn't even want uh, uh, to talk a lot about this. No, people were yawning. It was just like when it first came out, it was just because they were banned for a long time. If you're reading it, one Enoch, it's also got a lot of crazy uh, stuff in it. It's kind of a little much for people, I think, sometimes. And so it was, it, it was not received well. 
um, there in the beginning. So uh, it's, it's changed a lot now since the Dead Sea Scrolls thing. But okay, because Joseph Smith's access to the 1821 printing is unlikely, and some scholars have argued that he may have seen a purported 1828 American edition of the work. However, Yoko Ben Tal, online student, has shown that the arguments of Michael Quinn and Salvatore Cyril concerning this 1828 American printing are flawed in at least two major respects. One, Girl uh, badly misquotes Quinn as stating that the supposed 1828 printing happened in America. Not only does Quinn not say that, the National Union catalog says explicitly that it was Oxford. Number two, it's unlikely that there was an 1828 publication in Lawrence's translation of the Atlantic at all. An editor must have mistakenly read 1838 with 1828 when the entries were made for publication. Moreover, even if one Enoch had been available to the prophet, a study of, uh, by Larry Saint historian Jeff Woodworth concludes that the principal themes of Lawrence as well, 105 can say chapters do not resemble those of Enoch in any obvious way. I can tell you that's definitely the case if you, if you read through it. All right, in summary, it would have been virtually impossible for Joseph Smith in 1830 to have been aware of the most um, important resemblances to ancient literature in his Enoch revelations. Other than the limited and typically loose parallels found in one Enoch, which as discussed previously, was unlikely to have been available to Joseph Smith, the text that would have been required for a modern author to derive significant parts of Moses 6 through 7 had ne neither been discovered by Western scholars nor translated into English. Even if relevant and Masonic traditions had been available to Joseph Smith by 1830, they would not have provided the prophet with this suite of specific and sometimes peculiar details that you're going to hear in a second. They're shared by Moses 6, 7, and two paragraphs of light, two Enoch, three Enoch, and especially the Book of Giants. Okay, so, um, like I said, I'm going to exclude everything, so let's get into it now. Uh, one Enoch's off the table. Let's just take it off. Say, okay. So now you can guarantee nothing existed until way after Joseph's death. <laughs> Oh, uh, you got to love his enthusiasm, right? Now, understand, realize how I'm going to leave these plugged in just in case so the echo doesn't show up. I'll just leave them around my neck. Um, the LDS apologists are still so enamored with Hugh Nibley's approach to all of this. Uh, you know, Joseph Smith could not have known, and yet there are parallels, and therefore, revelation. And Joseph Smith's ideas are true. That whole paradigm is fatally refuted with the evidence. The problem is everyone keeps relying on Hugh Nibley. And he couldn't have been more wrong about it was a dead study in Joseph Smith's day, this book of Enoch, that there was no interest, that their Richard Lawrence translation was not available, let alone any of the other Enoch texts. There was no interest whatsoever, and yet Joseph Smith gets it right time and time and time again. I had on... Colby Townsend, just a couple of weeks ago, who, and, and we talked about this through a video presentation, a live session. But tonight, I'm going to share the details in his Enoch paper that completely destroy this apologetic. So let's get on with this. This is really important. Now, Colby Townsend wrote his paper about the same time that Jeff Roundy produced this video two years ago. So I don't know if Roundy would have had access. It wouldn't have mattered because, I mean, Jeff is almost giddily childlike, not childish, childlike in his bubbly enthusiasm. Oh, look, there was nothing available, and yet Joseph Smith got it right again and again and again and again. Oh, boy, it must be true. And Richard Bushman follows suit after Nibley. He hasn't bothered to look into stuff. D. Michael Quinn made a mistake. And so everybody says, well, see, D. Michael Quinn couldn't refute Hugh Nibley, and therefore none of this stuff was available to Joseph Smith. We win. I, I'm not exaggerating. You saw how he's acting. He is like a nine-year-old getting boatloads of candy for Halloween, man. No joke. 
Unfortunately, the sobering fact of historical evidence shows the exact opposite of what Hugh Nibley skimmed real quick in order to make the false claim. He found one or two scholars who said nobody's interested in this fake crap. And yet we have evidence now that everybody in both America and Britain were overwhelmingly talking, writing, and sharing conversations and public debates on this book of Enoch. I'm going to read several pages of Townsend's article while we're here. Now, one might expect to be able to locate this copy in the New York Public Library, but it does not exist. Now, they got that part right. It does not exist. The Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Books Division does not have any record of ever having an 1828 printing of Lawrence's Book of Enoch. It was realistically a misprint for the 1838 edition. And that's not a problem, though, because lots of other materials was available. We know Quinn's discovery only leads to a dead end. So Jed Woodworth following Nibley's lead now. See, they can't get rid of Nibley's ghost. During a summer seminar at BYU, attempting to situate Smith's extract of the prophecy of Enoch with specific themes in one Enoch, mainly by comparing and contrasting the depiction of God in the two texts. So later, while he was working on the biography of Joseph Smith now, Richard Bushman relied on Woodward's paper to provide historical background for his comments on Smith's extract, because Bushman didn't do his own research, but he relied on yet another LDS scholar who has no interest in finding any interest of Enoch in Joseph Smith's day. He wanted Nibley's thesis to be correct. So here's what Bushman said. He inaccurately claimed that up to 1830, modern biblical commentators on Enoch had been restricted to the five verses in Genesis and the three in the New Testament that speak of Enoch's genealogy, his prophecy of judgment, and ascent into heaven without dying. So Bushman was aware of Quinn's work on the issue. He rejected the idea that Smith might have had access to a copy of Lawrence's book of Enoch, assuming that Smith could only have known the contents of the book if he had a complete copy. And that is what Jeff Roundy in this video clip was so enthusiastic about. Look, Hugh Nibley couldn't find anything. It was dead to the world. Oh, look, Richard Bushman showed D. Michael Quinn was wrong, and he didn't agree with that, and he didn't find anything, etc. Notice how Jeff Roundy, in this video clip, is always, only, and ever researching one side only of the research. This is why Kobe Townsend is such a godsend to LDS apologetics if they would ever wake up and start reading him. And I have more copies, more information, reviews that I have shared, uh, that I have of Jeff Town of, of Kobe Townsend that I will post in the up and coming month this month. So, Bushman is incorrect. Hugh Nibley is incorrect. Here is what is going on. Contemporary scholars of Mormonism must revise their understanding of the place of Enochic literature in Europe and America prior to Joseph Smith's revision of the Bible in 1830, according to new research. And there's mountains of it available for Joseph Smith to use. 
truly. The new evidence shows that biblical scholars writing in English and other European languages had access to multiple extra-biblical sources on Enoch since at least the medieval period, and in 1601, Isaac Kalsoban expanded these sources when he copied extracts from the Greek text of one Enoch in the chronography of George Sincellus. These extracts were then used and made popular by scholars like Joseph Scaliger the next year. Beside this, however, medieval and Renaissance scholars long had access to references to one Enoch in multiple sources. In the next section, I will analyze the extent to which I've been able to locate the availability of information on one Enoch in English sources printed both in Britain and in the United States leading up to the 1820s. We start in 1715. There's numerous accounts of one Enoch and contents printed between 1715 and 1830. They had much more of one Enoch available to them just the, than just the reference in Jude, Richard Bushman was simply wrong, or a few scattered references in patristic literatures. In 1715, an English translation of portions was published from the Greek provided by Dr. Grobs, Spicelegium SS Potrum, including 20 pages from portions of one Enoch 1 through 22. In 17 1912, just before Lewis's publication in print, an English translation of the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs was printed in America. And this text explicitly cites one Enoch and discusses many of its themes. It was reprinted again in America soon after and became a popular source for scholarly treatments of world history at the time. Johann Fabricius published his famous Codex Pseudepigraphus Veteris Testamenti in 1713. So notice, all every year something new was coming out in Europe and being taken over to America. Fabricius was the first to gather together ancient Jewish and Christian texts under the term pseudepigrapher, which is the term he coined. So there is a reason he chose such a pejorative name for his collection. Several of his contemporaries actually believed that the texts were authentic and that they were ancient, genuine scripture worthy of inclusion in the Christian canon, and that did not suit him. The most vocal of these after Fabricius' initial publication was none other than William Whiston. Yes, that one, the famous translator of Josephus. Truly, he got involved with this. After his Antiquities of the Jews, he compiled many of the texts Fabricius labeled Pseudepigrapha. He translated them into English, and he published them in 1727 in a collection of authentic records belonging to the Old and New Testament. It included 10 pages of English translation of one Enoch and an extended argument in 14 pages defending the authenticity of the book. So we have Scaliger, we have Fabricius, and we have Whiston, which made the English audiences for the next 100 years aware that this prophecy of Enoch, quoted by the author of the Epistle of Jude, was at least partially accessible to them and their contemporaries. 1732, bumping up a few decades, John Chapman, a priest at the University of Cambridge, alluded to one Enoch in his book, Remarks on a Book on, entitled Christianity as Old as the Creation, as an ancient apocryphal book of Enoch, part of which is still preserved, giving a large account of the angels, their conduct, their punishments. Pointing his readers even further to that book, he suggested suggested that if they were interested in seeing a fuller account of this story, to consult Sincellus, Joseph, Scaliger, Heidegger, and Fabricius, and he provided references to each of those publications. Bumping up another decade to 1739, the Abbe Antoine Bonnier published the Mythology and Fables of the Ancients. In this volume, Bonnier described how an interpretation based on the Septuagint of Genesis 6, the Greek text, developed in antiquity, wherein giants were the offspring of angels and the daughters of men. He noted how the Septuagint Philo, Josephus, Justin, Clement of Alexandria, and even the rabbis and Muslims had adopted it. Next, he described how one Enoch contributed to the widespread influence of this idea, and that it was a very ancient book. 
Now, it was a heretical story. However, Bonaire provided a brief account of the narrative of the fallen angels as found in 1 Enoch. His summary incorporates the passages of the books that had recently been published in English by Mr. Lewis and William Whiston. 1747, bumping up a few more years, a group of British authors, they published a multi-set volume titled An Universal History from the Earliest Account of Time. In the first volume, one of the compilers wrote about the history of the world from the creation to the flood and noted that copies of one Enoch were then believed to be in Ethiopia and that Mr. Pirisk had used his utmost endeavors to get it thence, but to no purpose. In the body of his commentary on the history of the world, the compiler noted that Enoch was a prophet. Some of his prophecy was preserved, either in writing or tradition. It appears from a passage quoted thence by Jude. However, the piece under the title of the scripture of the prophecy of Enoch, of which we have some fragments, is allowed to be a manifest forgery, though several of the fathers had a better opinion of it than it deserves. In note B, the author refers the reader to the publication of these fragments by Joseph Scaliger and J. Gore's edition of George Sincellus's chronography. So in, in 1752, John, see, we're still in the 1700s, and we have already seen at least six publications. Not interested? Europe was ablaze with the Enoch materials. 1752, John Jackson reconciled all the ancient world history and his chronological antiquities, and he closely examined the major sources, including the Bible and other texts from antiquity. In his first volume, he discussed First Enoch, including Sincellus's extracts of that book, and he noted how it was frequently cited in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, in Clement of Alexandria, in Tertullian, Oregon, and Augustine. He argued with the 11th century author George Cadrenos that the descendants of Seth occupied an area in the upper hills around Eden and the children of Cain in the lower country. Around the year of the world, 1,000 Seth's sons of God fell in love with some of Cain's daughters of men. This led to a lawless tyranny in Babylon and the ancient Near East, tyrannical because it was not a patriarchal government. So Seth's descendants apostatized and injustice, violence, and war ensued. Accordingly, righteous Enoch preached to them in an attempt to save them from wickedness, but their disdain for his preaching was too intense and they turned to violence. Enoch was translated to heaven before they could harm him. In 1768, an article published in the Universal Magazine of Knowledge and Pleasure, and this discussed whether the patriarchs before the flood had delivered their knowledge by tradition, and whether Enoch wrote before that period. So it is in this essay, the anonymous author summarizes the references to one Enoch in the patristic literature, and he responds to the ongoing debate about whether Enoch actually wrote a book, handed down traditions that were later written into a book, or even possibly existed as oral tradition up to the writing of Jude. Notice there are passing down of the records. A Joseph Smith theme, of course. The author believed that Enoch had written a book and summarized some of the contents of one Enoch then known. Readers across the British American colonies throughout December 1773, note this, 1773, 35 years before Joseph Smith was born, or thereabouts, they would open their newspapers to read how James Bruce had gifted one of his three manuscript copies of the Ethiopic One Enoch to the King of France. Readers in Britain were made aware in September. On December 1st and in the days following, audiences throughout Pennsylvania would have learned in the Pennsylvania Gazette that letters from Paris mentioned that the Seur guys of the Academy at Marseille, secretary to the French king has had the honor to present to his majesty on the part of the chevalier James Bruce, a celebrated English traveler with whom he corresponded, an Abyssinian manuscript that contains the prophecy of Enoch. His majesty has ordered that this manuscript, of which St. Jerome makes mention, and which the late Sieur Colbert has searched for in vain, shall be deposited in his library. The same text was printed in the Maryland Gazette, December 9th, and on December 16th, it was printed in the Virginia Gazette and the Rhines, Virginia Gazette, 
no interest? Absolutely all the newspapers are talking about this book of Enoch and his famous prophecy. Bruce would publish his travels to discover the source of the Nile in 1790 throughout Great Britain, and the same year American citizens would be treated to an abridged version of the publication printed in New York. Both versions describes Bruce's discovery of one Enoch. In 1782, the third edition of William Alexander's The History of Women was published in London. Alexander's history began with the antediluvian women of the Bible. He described how soon after Cain and his family were exiled following the death of Abel, it did not take long for the group to abandon themselves to every species of wickedness. They were then known as the daughters of men because of their actions, and Seth's righteous line was called the sons and daughters of God. Seth's descendants lived on a hill near Eden and Cain's down in the valley. After a time, 120 of Seth's sons heard music at the bottom of the hill and decided to investigate. And after seeing beautiful naked women dancing, they were tempted to return from time to time and eventually decided to intermarry with Cain's line. Well, according to Alexander, this story gave birth to an opinion that by the sons of God, were meant angels, and that this version of the story was based on a forgery called the Prophecy of Enoch. In a lengthy footnote, Alexander provided a summary of the first part of one Enoch that by that time was common knowledge. The guardian angels were enamored by the human women they watched over, and they made a secret oath to go together and marry the women, and they would choose. Their offsprings became giants who eventually began to eat humans, which caused the humans' cries to go up to God. In time, God sent four archangels down to bind and imprison the angels to the earth and to destroy the giants. This wickedness led to the flood. By 1783, enough of one Enoch was available to English readers that the author Samuel Hull wrote a lengthy poem based on the angel Azazel of one Enoch. At the beginning of the original publication, a three-page advertisement was added to provide context for the readers of the poem. Since many readers may be unacquainted with Azazel, the chief angel in the machinery of the poem, According to the author of the advertisement, it was supposed by Josephus and Philo and Judaeus and several others that angels before the flood were enamored of women, but this opinion was chiefly propagated by a forgery entitled The Prophecy of Enoch. Further, the watching angels fell in love with the daughters of men and proposed to one another that they should go down and attach themselves to the daughters of Eve— the author of the advertisement knew the names of several of these angels and provided enough context for the reader of the poem to be familiar with the contents of most of the Book of Watchers, or 1 Enoch 1 through 36. Hull's poem shows a deep awareness of the contents of 1 Enoch and portrays the uneasiness of the relationships between the fallen angels and their human wives. A shift in individual opinion about the story of these fallen angels and the daughters of men is found in William Haley's 1786 publication, A Philosophical, Historical, and Moral Essay on Old Maids. <laughs> what a topic, right? <laughs> After first attacking and dismissing the story, Haley reverts his position. And he states that I was grossly mistaken in my conjectural account of antidiluvian virginity, and that a new discovery made by a renowned traveling friend destroys my hypothesis. Bruce, who was Haley's friend, had written him a letter from Spain explaining the discovery and how he could clearly prove that the fragment must have proceeded from the pen of Enoch himself, written by his own hand, perhaps, you know, and that he can demonstrate by unanswerable arguments that this fragment was contained among those very writings of Enoch, which the pious Tertullian declared he had perused. Now, although much of what Haley wrote about this story in his essay is disconnected from the reality of Bruce's discovery, it does offer another example of the widespread knowledge about what Bruce had found in 1797. Now, look, we've come up 
50, 60, 70 years, and there has been nothing but nonstop publications about this, either in articles, poems, learned essays, dissertations, arguments, encyclopedias, or books, all over Europe, and those were being transferred back and forth between Europe and America. No interest in Enoch? Nibley was dreaming. I'm nowhere near done yet. I should say Townsend is nowhere near done yet. By 1797, the Encyclopedia Britannica included an entry on Enoch that listed contemporary approaches to explaining the relationship between Jude 1415 and one Enoch. The question is whether the apostle took this passage out of any particular book written by Enoch, which might be extant in the first ages of the church, whether he received it by, say, tradition, or lastly, by some particular revelation. See, after describing some of the ancient Christian patristic commentary on one Enoch, the editors turned to Scaliger, and then to the Greek and the rabbinic traditions. And so these three options for interpreting the relationship between the epistle of Jude and one Enoch remain normative until at least 1830. So although many British and English public and American publications had already previously engaged extensively with one Enoch up to the year 1800, more direct analysis on the text began to appear in earnest in 1801. So when we look at the February 1801 issue of the Monthly Magazine, or British Register, an anonymous author wrote concerning the writings and readings of Jude, the author provided a detailed history that engaged with several ancient pseudepigrapha, including 4th Ezra, the Assumption of Moses, and 1 Enoch. Notice what's becoming available to Joseph Smith to study. The pseudepigrapha, the fourth Ezra, the assumption of Moses, and one Enoch. It's broadening out here, and this in early 1800. So uh, I didn't, Colby didn't say that I am. One Enoch, back to Colby Townsend, one Enoch received special attention. The author describes 17th century failed attempts to discover a full copy of the book in Ethiopia until the discovery made by Bruce. Since Bruce left a copy of one Enoch in Paris, another one in London, and kept one in his own possession, it's no wonder that scholars would be interested in seeing these copies for themselves. Of course they would. Nibley said there's no interest in this. He is out to lunch. He's not doing scholarship. He's doing apologetic. And every one of the LDS scholars simply accepts what Nibley said. None of them do their own research. And they simply keep repeating the false information historically Nibley provided. Because he's trying to distance the gap so that he can claim a special revelation is the only way Joseph Smith could have got that information. And Jeff Roundy, unfortunately, falls right into that pit following the blind being blind himself to this blind spot. Kobe Townsend is a much more careful, thorough, and convincing scholar with his excellent research and scholarship. The author of these essays provides an English translation of extracts from one Enoch that are designated in the modern scholarly chapter and verse system as one Enoch 1, 1 through 2, 3, 6, 1 through 13, 10, and so on and so forth, which he made based on the Latin translation of C.G. Woyd. So Woyd had himself traveled to Paris to make a copy of the manuscript of one Enoch Bruce had deposited there. That year, which was 1801, the monthly magazine featured two more essays that directly commented on one Enoch, one published in March, the other one in May. Not long after this publication in 1801, parts of one Enoch were again translated into English and published to a broad audience, this time in both Britain and America. 1801. In January 1806, just five years later, the Orthodox Churchman's Magazine in Review published an essay on the apocryphal book of Enoch by an anonymous author only identifying himself as W. 
The author begins by assuming that all of the journal's readers are familiar with the passage in Jude that references a prophecy of Enoch and how the Ethiopians had long had this prophecy in their canon in one Enoch. He then notes the failed attempts to find the copy until Bruce found it. This author likewise mentions Dr. Boyd's travel and copying of the manuscript of one Enoch in Paris and how the source for his English translation is the French scholar M. D. Sassy. Notice this. We're getting English copies of, of Enoch in the 1800s. We're getting French copies. We're getting Latin copies. And I mean in the 1700s. I'm not talking anciently. This thing is being distributed across countries and being translated in many languages and is being looked for, and people want to see what this says. No interest in it? The LDS apologetics is just nonsense. We're nowhere near done yet. I haven't even gotten to the good part of this essay yet. I, I'm sincerely serious. The bulk of the essay is a fresh English translation of one Enoch, and the contents included are slightly different from that found in the 1801 publication. W translated one Enoch one through nine and six to eight and 32, 1 through 6, and he made a few errors of the identification of the chapter headings. The article was reprinted in the February 1808 issue of the Churchman's Magazine in New York. Several more references to one Enoch were made in 1801, in 1806, 1809, 1810, 1811, 1813, in both Britain and America. In 1812, one Enoch was mentioned in several entries in Charles Taylor's edition of Comet's Great Dictionary of the Holy Bible. Under the entry for Angel, the editor of the dictionary assumed the readers were aware of one Enoch when he noted, it is true we find many angels called by their names in the book of Enoch, but that is of no authority. Later under the entry of Demon, the editor noted that the apocryphal book of Enoch and some passages of the Septuagint misled several of the ancient fathers to assert that angels and demons had certain subtile bodies and particular passions which consist only with material substance. You're hearing rings of echoes, potentials of Joseph Smith's doctrines? of spirit being matter, only more refined of stuff? Yes. Subtile bodies and particular passions, which consist only with material substance. They went on to argue that angels are immaterial and that those angels who kept not their first estate, that's a quote, were sent directly from heaven to hell without ever having physical forms. Under the second entry on Enoch, the editor noted the quotation in Jude and is the exact same as the text found in the 1797 printing in the Encyclopedia Britannica. So now several of the sources are beginning to quote each other, both from Britain and those printed in America. By now, equally Many, 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 many published sources. And we're only in 1797 here discussing this. The editor then went on to describe different religious and geographical traditions about the character of Enoch. Finally, under the entry on Jude, the editor went away from the opinion in the entry on Enoch and suggested that Jude might have understood what was inspired within one Enoch and what was not. In 1815, Robert Mayo borrowed material from Banir's 1739, The Mythology and Fables of the Ancients. And the reason he did that is he wanted to describe the fallen angels and one Enoch. That same year, T. Bensley printed the works of Nathaniel Lardner in London, and the first volume included Lardner's credibility of the gospel history. He looked closely at the writings of various early Christians in order to examine what books of the Bible were quoted as authoritative in early Christianity. In the section on Tertullian, he spent a significant amount of time on the epistle of Jude and its quotation of one Enoch. He noted that the book was also quoted in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs and was dependent on William Whiston's 1727 publication. 
So he later noted that Oregon quoted one Enoch of scripture, but also that Oregon stated that the early church as he knew it did not view one Enoch as divine. The eminent and well-known commentator on the Bible, Adam Clark, Adam Clark, the LDS scholar Thomas Wayman, just recently wrote a BYU Studies article within the last couple of years demonstrating proof positive that Joseph Smith extensively utilized Adam Clark in his Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. You see, the LDS apologists don't want us to know the true history, apparently. Let's keep reading. Adam Clark mentioned one Enoch several times in the final volume of his commentary on the New Testament. First, he mentioned the book in the preface to 2 John, among other non-canonical writings that early Christians had cited. Alluding to one Enoch and others, Clark wrote, Some are come down to the present time, but are convicted of forgery by the sentiment, the style, the doctrine. In his preface to Jude, he quoted heavily from the work of Johann David Michaelis, an 18th century biblical scholar, to explain how it was unclear whether or not Enoch had written a book and if he was actually a prophet. In any case, in his commentary on Jude 14, 15, Clark noted that one Enoch is still extant among the Abyssinians. So, more pronouncements about one Enoch were made in both America and Britain. The Republican compiler announced on November 29th, 1820, that the renowned biblical scholar, get this, even Wilhelm Jesenius got involved. He was working on a translation from the Abyssinian language of one Enoch. Only a few months later, the Maryland Gazette announced on July 26, 1821, the publication of Lawrence's translation. And the next year started to see book-length responses to one Enoch. No interest? It was dead? Did you notice how fast Jeff Roundy was to hurry up and get it off the table? Well, Hugh Nibley said there was no interest. It's dead. Nobody looked at it. So let's get that off the table. Now let's get to the good stuff. No, no, you don't get a cheat with the historical sources that way by only quoting your own scholars. That's apologetic. What Townsend is doing here is scholarship. I'll go with the scholarship. So... John Overton's inquiry into the truth and use of the Book of Enoch explicitly responded to Lawrence's work and built up on it by examining how 19th century Christian scholars might appropriate aspects of the Book of Enoch into their understanding of early Judaism and Christianity. And is that not what we find Joseph Smith doing? Yes, it is. Ultimately, Overton found the Book of Enoch to be useful and informative in dozens of ways. So he recommended to his readers form their own opinions of the book by using their own judgment, which apparently Joseph Smith did very, very well. Now, in 1822, several British newspapers announced the coming publication of Thomas More's 1823, The Loves of the Angels, and its literary dependence on the Book of Enoch. In 1823, Thomas Tomkinson's grandson published in Britain his predecessor's late 17th century book, A Practical Discourse Upon the Epistle by Jude. In it, Tomkinson mentioned the contemporary 17th century approaches to understanding what it was that Jude 14, 15 was quoting, whether it was a book, was it a tradition, was it a revelation, and used the testament of the 12 patriarchs to argue that the biblical patriarchs had a book of Enoch since they clearly quoted from one in the testaments. This was in 1821, you guys. No interest? What on earth are the apologists talking about? Because they don't want there to be any interest, so they quit looking. And then they simply falsely proclaimed 
Eh, well, it was a dead study. Throw it off the table. And now let's see what Joseph Smith could have gotten only by revelation because nothing was available. I, I have been doing nothing but quoting dozens of sources in Britain and America from the Book of Enoch about the Book of Enoch. Wow. That same year, the Wesleyan Methodist magazine published an excerpt of the first couple chapters from Lawrence's Book of Enoch. The year 1825 witnessed an explosion. An explosion, Townsley says, Townsend says, of popular and scholarly publications that either discussed or were dependent on one Enoch. The works of the Right Honorable Lord Byron were published in Philadelphia. And it included in volume five of that collection, Byron's Heaven and Earth a Mystery. Byron explicitly referenced one Enoch, noted that it was preserved by the Ethiopians, that angels and humans could not intermarry because mortals are sent upon the earth to toil and die, and the angels are made to minister on high. He also noted, agreeing with the 18th and early 19th century consensus, that Genesis 6 was about Cain and Seth's lines intermarrying. An article was printed that year, 1825, in the Christian Observer that, although brief, engaged with much of the contemporary knowledge about one. And see, they're not just simply saying, oh, well, you know, we found the Book of Enoch. They are discussing it. They are analyzing it. They are arguing with it. They are agreeing and disagreeing. They are trying to integrate the Book of Enoch. How did this work with the Bible since it was in the text as Scripture? They're not just calling it by name and moving on. They are exploring and examining and testing this thing and comparing and cross-referencing and checking. And they're quoting all of the scholars they can gather. They are absolutely thrilled to have so much material to explore the validity of the Old Testament patriarchs, especially Enoch. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Joseph Scaliger, George Sincellus's chronography was used. Some people believed one Enoch was a forgery based on Jude. Some 17th century scholars argued it could be a Greek translation of a Hebrew or an Aramaic original. And Ludoff failed in his attempts to discover it and was left to Bruce to make the discovery. Lawrence translated and published Bruce's text. The anonymous author ended the essay by providing a summary of the contents of the Book of Enoch. So that same year, again, we are talking, uh, let's see, what year is this? 1825. That same year, Thomas Hartwell Horns, An Introduction to the Critical Study and Knowledge of the Holy Scriptures, was published in Philadelphia. In it incorporated much of the same content as the previously discussed essay, except that Horn argued that one Enoch was a second century era forgery, and that the author of one Enoch was dependent on the book of Daniel for style and other aspects of their new competition. So, they are exploring the relationship of Enoch with other scriptural texts. They aren't just mentioning the name Enoch. This is a very significant scholarly digestion, argument, presentation, discussion back and forth, analysis, publication after publication after publication with dozens of scholars by 1825 jumping into this in Philadelphia, in New York, in Maine, everywhere, and in Britain. This was a huge topic. The Mormon blind spot has been discovered, right, in order to create a false narrative about the availability of the Book of Enoch. And we're not done yet. We're not even to the good part of the essay yet. I told you there was a mountain of evidence first. I'm trying to share this information with you. It's critical that you understand how utterly 
insignificant and skimpy the Mormon argument is on this book of Enoch with Joseph Smith. Continuing in 1825, James Sabine responded to a book by Walther Balfour in a series of lectures, a series of lectures. Now that means dozens, if not hundreds of people from all over the country, possibly from out of state, are attending these lectures and they are being published. Both theologians were focused on explaining hell and the end of the world and disagreed about whether or not one name it could be helpful in understanding early Jewish and Christian ideas about these topics. Sabine argued that Enoch and Noah prophesied about impending retribution on the wicked and the righteous, and Enoch particularly prophesied about destruction. Sabine argued that whether or not the current book of Enoch, which he implied both he and Balfour had copies of in America, but that Balfour had scarcely glanced at, was exactly the same as the book that Jude quoted, or had it been corrupted. For Sabine, what mattered was that the book represented early Jewish thought on Sheol and retribution. So you can see it's not just one subject that the book of Enoch is talking about, nor is it just one subject within the book of Enoch that people are discussing. They're giving lectures, they're debating, they're publishing, they're analyzing in scholarly aspects, in John Q. public publications. This thing is everywhere. That's what I wanted you to see. In his response to Sabine, Balfour was not interested just in ancient Jewish interpretation, but whether or not the writers of apocryphal texts had been divinely inspired or if their ideas had support in the Bible. And is not that one of Joseph Smith's concerns? It even made it into the DNC as scripture. And they say there's no influence. Of course there is. And it's all in Joseph Smith's environment. Definitely. It's significant that the two authors engaged in a public debate in Boston in 1825. Both had access to the full text of one Enoch. In 1826, S. Schmucker argued that one Enoch was a forgery. It was based on Jude 6 and 14 and 15. And since the story of the fallen angels had nothing to do with Enoch in the Bible, its forger took the idea for the book from Jude 6. A similar idea about one Enoch also influenced Archibald Alexander's The Canon of the Old and New Testaments Asserted. Alexander noted in his book that in the past, the canonicity of the Epistle of Jude had been challenged because of its quotation of a few apocryphal sources, especially one Enoch. He denied that this makes any difference for Jude's authority because Jude does not say he quoted any books from Enoch. And even if he did, Paul quoted from pagan authors all the time without imputing any canonical status to them. So in 1826, notice it's not just maybe a one here and then 18 years later, maybe a rare one over there. and Oh, another 25 years later, and someone finally decided, oh gosh, I wonder what Enoch's all about. Every year they are talking, publishing, discussing, analyzing, comparing, and referencing as far and wide as they know how. They are into the scripture. They are into the apocrypha as as he just noted, Townsend demonstrated they are interested in the pseudepigrapha. They are interested in Josephus and the ancient history. They are interested in the early church fathers. All of this is being discussed, passed around, and bandied about in Joseph Smith's day, in Joseph Smith's backyard. I'm not done. In 1826, two more articles on the Book of Enoch were published in the Classical Journal in Britain. The anonymous remarks on ancient chronology was hopeful that 
the new translation. See, they're continually translating it as well of this Enoch book, presumably Lawrence's translation, would help to explain the antediluvian history of the Bible and was aware of the fragments that were available prior to the printing of Lawrence's book. The second essay explicitly cited Lawrence's translation and found no reason to agree with Lawrence that Enoch did not author the book himself. Instead, he relied on Jackson's 1752 Chronological Antiquities to argue against Lawrence on several points, believing that one Enoch was written during the time of the patriarchs. So in July 1827, notice they're not, it's a nonstop steady publication, several of them every year before Joseph Smith had his revelation way later in 1830. In July 1827, the National Gazette, again published in Philadelphia, reprinted an announcement on the sale of Bruce's personal library due to his recent passing. It included the Book of Enoch, which was first brought into Europe by Mr. Bruce. The three copies of it originally belonged to him, one's in Paris, the other in Oxford. All are known to exist on our continent. Back in Britain, a book-length investigation into one Enoch by J.M. Butt was published, but argued that the book quoted Jude was in fact one Enoch, since that was the common assumption in early Christianity by all those who had the book. He then argued from internal and external evidence, notice how they're analyzing this, that it was authored sometime during the reign of Herod. He also explored dozens of other questions relating to one Enoch and possible reasons why the book was denied entrance into the canon in early Christianity. Lost scriptures. Wow. Does that ring a bell to any of you Mormons? This is 1825, you guys. 1825, you guys. Book of Mormon wasn't even here. That same year, 1825, John Oxley published letters he had written to Richard Lawrence about his recent publications on apocryphal texts. Oxley argued against the then common argument that Jude did not necessarily view one Enoch as an inspired text, similar to how Paul quoted Menander and others without viewing their works as divine. Oxley stated that Jude does not reference one Enoch as some heathen poet, but as a significant Hebrew patriarch, similar to how the author of Matthew quoted single verses from the eminent Hebrew prophet Isaiah. It would not be logical to argue that Matthew only found those specific verses inspired, but not the whole book. Oxley agreed with some other commentators that the book was written sometime between the Babylonian exile and the first century of the Common Era. By the late 1820s, we are still pre-Book of Mormon, let alone pre-Bible translation by Joseph Smith. By the late 1820s, Many commentators were already advancing conclusions about one Enoch that would become standard academic approaches to the text by the 20th century. There were more references in English literature in 1828, in 1829, and in 1830, there were several significant publications. One briefly mentioned one Enoch to observe that it was of too little value to be preserved and another that Enoch was the first, <clears throat> listen up, another one of these publications stated that Enoch was the first astrologer, Abraham, a celebrated magician of Chaldea, having inherited knowledge of the heavenly bodies from Enoch and how one Enoch was one among at least a couple of other writings from the patriarchs that were lost. Does that ring any bells to anybody? Say, Book of Moses, Book of Abraham? And Nibley's trying to convince everyone there's no interest in this whatsoever. <laughs> and yet today's apologists just simply swallow Nibley whole without doing any research of their own. Is it any wonder they can't convince any scholars to take him seriously? It's just 
inbred scholarship that the Mormons produce and share. And none of it's accurate or up to date. So this adds a potentially new way of understanding why Joseph Smith Jr., as well as other early American authors, would focus on expanding the biblical stories of Enoch, of Abraham, of the patriarchs. In July 1829, a review article, a review article. Now, this is what happened. It's going to review Lawrence, it's going to review Oxley, and it's going to review Butt's books in the British journal, The Christian Observer. The next February, the National Gazette announced the contents of that month's publication in the Christian Observer's American counterpart, the religious magazine. No interest. They're publishing book after book after book after article after article after article, and they're sharing it across the ocean, man. What more do you want? This is breathtaking. This single article distilled into one place, 1829. It put all of it together in one place, the major scholarship up to that point on one Enoch. The author himself believed strongly that the book was written in the second century of the Common Era. He noted that other scholars believed it was written sometime between the Babylonian exile and the first century of the Common Era. He discussed all of the major Christians who commented on one Enoch, its loss in late antiquity, the belief by the 17th century that it was in Ethiopia, and the failure of some to find and locate a copy, and the eventual discovery by Bruce. He described the history from Bruce to Lawrence and the various efforts to get the text into wider circulation by De Sacy and Jessenius until Lawrence's successful publication. He described how scholarly approaches to the complicated compositional history of one Enoch had already become sophisticated by the early 19th century. First Enoch was not just one single book, but multiple books that had been brought together into one. He took issue with some of the textual emendations that Lawrence made throughout his version of the book, and then he proceeded to describe in detail the contents of the different books scholars at the time identified had been edited together to form one Enoch. In all, there were nine separate and distinct books. The author then promised to look at the dating of one Enoch closer in a future publication. So, what has been highlighted here is the fact that, contrary to previous treatment of the subject, interest in one Enoch did not die down during the period between Bruce's discovery of the book to 1800 or from 1800 until Lawrence's translation of the full text in 1821. Interest continued to steadily grow with multiple independent English translations of Syncellus's excerpt of the book becoming available in print up to 1800. Much of that literature was reprinted in the early United States within only a few years. And then in the 1820s, there was an explosion of interest in the book in both. Britain and the United States, this leading up to Joseph Smith's work in the latter half of 1830. So it's fitting that Smith would focus on the character of Enoch for an expansive retelling of Genesis, since from 1825 onward, so much attention was paid to one Enoch in both Britain and the United States, and they were in communication with each other. The documents analyzed in this paper also show that it was possible for a general English-speaking audience to have access to at least the general story found in the Book of Watchers from multiple sources. And those suggest that there was a robust shared tradition about the lost Book of Enoch.
This tradition, which would have been both textual and oral, dealt with fallen angels, secret oaths by the angels, or Seth's children, to go against God's will, a vision Enoch had of all of history from the creation to the future destruction of the world. The idea that Enoch was part of an early tradition of scribes and scribal culture, that he or God had to fend off wicked enemies who would not accept the gospel, and that the book was a second century common forgery based on the epistle of Jude. Of utmost importance in analyzing these printed texts is that scholars today Scholars today recognize that these publications do not represent all of what was available in print during the late 18th and early 19th centuries in the transatlantic book trade, nor do they represent fully the conversations that English speakers were having about Enoch in both Britain and the United States. We do not have direct, ac direct access to the conversations that Protestants would have had on a day-to-day -day or a week-by-week -week basis about biblical subjects. Remember, we're talking about the burned-over district, you guys. They were religiously in a furor, according to Mormon apologetics. A huge part of that furor was this book of Enoch. they would have found this important. So what we have is a fragmentary historical record. This paper has only analyzed a fraction of what would have been available in print. And future work should consider British and early Anglo-American manuscript sources to see how the Book of Enoch was discussed. And in the case of revivals and weekly sermons performed in Britain and early American contexts, regarding the discussions in Mormon studies and other literary subfields related to contemporaries of Smith, the availability of ideas about one Enoch and some of the actual content were far more complicated than has usually been assumed in past scholarship. More recent work in Blake studies has highlighted the fact that William Blake did not need to rely solely on Lawrence's 1821 book of Enoch either in order to perform his work. He also took a huge interest in the book of Enoch. And the question is, did he have access to it? It would be advisable for Mormon studies to begin a shift toward recognizing this same in early Mormon history. Now, this is seriously significant. This research shows us why we cannot take Mormon scholarship as the final say-so in much of anything. Anything they say in a conclusion that supports Joseph Smith, the first thing you don't do is believe it. You start researching because there is something being left out. There is something being twisted. There is something being warped in order to make it look good for Joseph Smith. And that's so unfortunate but that's how they deal with it. Colby Townsend's article here, absolutely powerful. So my challenge to Jeff Roundy is update your video because you're just wrong, cowboy. You're just wrong. So thanks for watching my Backyard Professor response. This is a little bit longer response than I normally do, but it was important for you to see this. It is very important because the Mormons claim some of their strongest stuff comes out of this Enoch material. And now it looks like it's just run-of-the-mill stuff that was occurring absolutely all over Britain and America, all the way through Joseph Smith's life.